day not very long ago, but when the world still allowed freedom of movement, I visited Rufus Wainwright at his LA home and we sat in the backyard talking about what soothes his soul, a cultural movement to turn off our devices, rhyming, why reading matters, and the why and how of being an active conduit for ideas, all set to a bubbling fountain. We are sitting outside in your yard, and we have some running water in the background. Yes. It's a fountain for some ambiance. Yes, with little koi fish <laughs> swimming around <laughs> the L.A. pastime. <laughs> One of the things that you talk a lot about is your family, and you come from a musical family, and I had the opportunity of coming to a private concert of yours recently, and your sister was involved, and... Can you talk a little bit about why family matters for you? Yeah, well, I, uh, let's see, I was brought up in kind of a musical dynasty. Um, my mother was a great singer uh, and songwriter and pianist named Kate McGarrigle. Sadly, she passed away um, about 10 years ago. And, and my dad still sings. He's great. He's a, and he's a great singer and songwriter uh, named Loudon Wainwright the third and so yeah and he still performs regularly um and when they kind of got together in the 70s um you know my mother was singing with her sister anna and then uh, you know i think their other sister ended up jane ended up managing them and i think my father's sister was managing him teddy <laughs> wainwright and uh so it just sort of turned into this exponentially <laughs> huge uh, amount of musicians, you know, within the family. Um, and uh, and it, I don't know, it just, it, it was, maybe it was also like the fact that, you know, I mean, my parents split up when I was quite young, when I was three, and we went back up to Canada. Um, but we, I don't know, we, we always hung out, you know, with with my aunts and her cousins and her, her children who were our cousins and sang and and it just, I don't know, it just, music was everywhere. So it kind of kept us together, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I think if we did, hadn't have had these, you know, several careers uh, to um, kind of promote, whether it's our parents or eventually our own, or also, you know, our aunts and uncles, um, it was, uh, I don't know, we probably wouldn't have had such a strong family connection. So it was definitely connected to music. So when you were growing up, did did you sing with your family? Yeah, no, all the time. I mean, one of the big one of the big things that happened was that my grandmother on my mother's side, who was um, French Canadian, and she she had been one of um, twelve children, uh, from a, you know a pretty poor family in Quebec. Anyways, she she really had to work her whole life to support her brothers and sisters, um, and she and anyways, but she and I think certain of her kind of ambitions were curtailed, shall we say. Um, and and really once she had grandchildren and, and these daughters who were singing all the time, and you know, it obviously sprung from some talent that she must have had, but never really got to, um, you know, uh, uh, do. And so she, so, so I don't know, her living room kind of became like a show place <laughs> or a little stage, you know, and we would do these con these like evenings for my grandmother. And she would, of course, be the big finale <laughs> and do her, you know, body number from the p depression, you know. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So do you remember a time before you sang? No, no, no. It was, it was constant. I mean, my mother especially was was particularly uh, dominated by, by music. I mean, she really, she played piano all the time, sang a lot, wrote a lot. Um, she, in my opinion, was uh, really a genius uh, and, and kind of an unsung genius, mainly because she's, uh, she, um, you know, she just didn't have the ambition mm -hmm. that a lot of other people in her field had. And, you know, she went to, she was in LA and New York in the 70s and sung with, you know, Linda Ronstadt and, and Emmylou Harris and Bonnie Ray. Like, she was part of that whole scene. But she just didn't have the gumption to really stay and, you know, um, play the game as much. So she retreated 
uh, back to Canada and to be a mom. You know, she really wanted to just be a mom. And she still kept writing. But once again, I think a lot of her ambition that was also curtailed by not by having t- gone back to Canada was then, you know, infused in Martha and I. And, uh, and we just continued to making music. So when you are performing in between songs, you tell stories. But really, when you're singing, you're also telling stories. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about the relationship between storytelling and yeah. and performance yeah. and and music? Yeah. Well, I was all you know. I grew up with my parents basically, kind of jousting with each other through song. I mean, they wrote. He, my mother wrote some of her greatest love songs and some of her you know, most kind of cutting numbers too about my dad and vice versa. Um, so they were very confessional um, and it was in a weird way also both about their their relationship and about their lives and that was a way that I at a very young age really from the time I was cognizant um, or aware I should say um, you know that that was a language that I was um, uh, that I was privy to and that I could understand really intimately because I you know that they were being really being themselves up there um, and so there was no filter really, so for better or for worse. And, uh, so I continued, my sister and I continued that, um, that, that, uh, tradition of telling our stories through songs and, you know, and, and relating to an audience, um, what was going on really in our lives. It, it's in, and it's interesting because it's not, it's only recently I've discovered that that didn't have to be at all the case. <laughs> uh, mainly with, um, I've become quite obsessed with Randy Newman especially living in LA now. And and, uh, and I'd, I'd always loved his music, but I, of late I've really gotten into it more. And some and, and Mitchell Froome, who produced my last record and also worked a lot with uh, Randy, he, he just, I said like, who are these songs about? And he's like, they're not about anybody. He's totally, he writes, uh, they're all creations. They have nothing to do with his personal life. They have nothing to do with, with anybody in his family. Um, they're complete, you know, setups and uh, you know and it was really kind of heart wrenching to me because there's some of them are so beautiful and I'm like I didn't have to sacrifice you know my personal life for my music uh, but you know the train has left the station in that respect and I you know and I continue to mine my own you know experiences so interesting because hearing you say that and the fact that they are not about anyone that kind of made me sad, right, when yeah, you said that too. Yeah. And and my, I mean, my creative expression, it's totally different, you know, however, who I'm spending time with, right. what music I'm listening to, what I'm reading, right, right. it makes its way into my essays and into yeah, my talks. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and yeah, I don't yeah. actually know how to relate to the world other than through my I own know, experiences. I know. No, I'm, I'm very much that way as well. I think, I don't know if you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but Randy, yeah, but but he isn't, you know. And and I think there are people. Yeah, I guess it's two types of creatures, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so so I'm 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 one one of them, the more you know, transparent one, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like it because I think that there's, I don't. It's authentic, yes. right? No, and it's, it's very authentic. And it's true. It's very real. It, it's a bit of the harder road um, sometimes. Um, because you sort of, I don't know, you really do, I mean, I certainly, you know, in my upbringing, um, uh, or really professional upbringing, I should say, when I started to really do shows and do press and stuff, I, you know, I, I would kind of go over the line sometimes, uh, with, but mostly with my dad, because mm-hmm. you know, my dad and I had, had, um, you know, we had real struggles, uh, for a long time, and, uh, and I wasn't always, you know, cognizant of how to really you know draw boundaries and 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 uh and neither was he so 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 it, it can get a little messy sometimes but it's you know it's 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 uh i think it's worth the fight <laughs> you know i don't think i know a single man who doesn't have yeah. a challenging relationship <laughs> with his father yeah yeah uh you know what and, you know, peaks and valleys, yeah, you know, over yeah, long periods yeah, of time. No, no. But I think there's, you know, some um, essential. Yeah. The thing that's so crazy about my dad right now is that I'm just so aware of how powerful 
his presence is in my life, regardless of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if he's if we're in a good place, it's I'm great, and if, if we're in a bad place, I'm just totally devastated. And it's and I'm sure a lot of that's the same for him. And it's and it's this kind of strange thing where it doesn't really matter who's right or who's wrong or who did what to whom or or you just have to kind of come to some sort of agreement for 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 the for the sanity of your of your soul in a strange way with 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 your parents with your father especially so someone once told me that you can only be as happy as your most unhappy child <laughs> and i think that that is true yeah, yeah, uh, yeah but i didn't think about it in the reverse yeah yeah <laughs> So how do you how do you parent? Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, well I parent with you know my my husband Jorn mm -hmm. um, and also uh, we share custody with with uh, Viva mm -hmm. Viva's mother mm -hmm. and uh, so we you know the reason we're here in this beautiful garden today is that I um, you know I in L A is that at a certain point um, I realized that I had a why well, I didn't realize it. I knew I had a daughter here in California, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but it really dawned on me um, that you know I really need to live here. <laughs> therefore, therefore, and it, it might not seem so obvious, but uh, but 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 it, but uh, but it, but it, but it really hit me at, like a ton of bricks. Really, when she was you know becoming you know she started to talk and started to ask questions, mm -hmm. and wondering where I was and why I was you know traveling all the time. So so we located here, mm -hmm. which has been amazing. We love L.A. and uh, we love actually building our lives around this child. So, yeah, but we parent, you know, we, we all parent very differently. I'm sure. You know, her mom does and I do and Yorn does. I mean, Yorn is from a very kind of, I want to say regular, yeah, regular, solid, middle-class German kind of background where, where uh, you know, the, 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 his mother was a housewife and mm -hmm. his parents have been married for 50 years mm -hmm. and, and uh and and he really was brought up with these incredibly um, kind of solid uh, rules <laughs> that, uh, that that's, especially with little kids, um, it's amazing to watch him with Viva because mm -hmm. he just has the language. He has he knows how to just lay down the law mm -hmm. and not sort of negotiate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, on the other hand, am you know the Irish Bohemian, you know. Whatever spoiler, <laughs> and uh, but that's good too, you know. And then mm -hmm. her mom, her mother is Jewish, and, mm -hmm. and that that that's a whole other you know set of values. So mm -hmm. it's, so it's, so so she has a, a, a choice of three kind of rows, and I think at times it can be very confusing for her, and it's and and we have to. It can be quite difficult to to get you know on the same page. But that being said, I think it also gives her more options. Yeah. So it's it's I think in the end it's it's a plus. So you said something about having your soul soothed um, in terms of your relationship with your dad. What what else soothes your soul? Uh, yeah. What else soothes my soul? That's a good that's a good uh, that's a deep question. Uh, <laughs> only because I'm very you know I am at an interesting point now. I'm 46. I'm I finished an album called Unfollow the Rules, which is coming out in April. And uh, I'm work we're, we're working very hard to uh, promote it now and setting up the tour and, and so forth. And it's, and it is, I, I'm very proud of this record. Um, and, it, and it definitely encapsulates a kind of um, learning curve that, uh, that I've, I wouldn't say I've mastered or anything, but it's, I've worked hard on it for many, many years, especially my voice mm -hmm. um, and my lyrics, actually. So, so I'm I'm kind of at the, in my view, anyways, in my mind, I'm sort of at the zenith of, of my of my abilities. Um, and there, and and that, and 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 what that what I've realized is that that's like, I mean, I'm really happy about that, but it has nothing to do with soothing my soul. <laughs> You know, if anything, it's almost a little bit disconcerting mm -hmm. to get to this point because you're, you know, you you spend so much of your life, you know, grasping for what you want, and then of course once once you get it, it's, you realize that it has nothing to do with what you actually need and what actually uh, 
will, will, will help you out. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm very happy to be here. Of course. <laughs> and, and so forth. Um, so I would say what's been soothing my soul of late is when people really uh, get out of their comfort zone and, and try to, you know, make the world a better place. Uh, and uh, and watching that, you know, Jane Fonda's kind of been soothing my soul a bit. <laughs> I mean, if she can get out there every week, if she can move to D.C. and like do do rallies, you know, constantly, that's that's pretty exciting, you know, to see someone like that do that. So that's soothing, yeah. And uh, and also, what else soothes my soul? I think also just getting. Uh, some time al at my house <laughs> is nice. Yeah. I, I I spend so much time touring mm -hmm. and and doing shows and to actually be here in this beautiful house that I've worked so hard to um, to garner. I mean, it's it's uh, actually I need to actually spend time here. So so being at home is also great. So between saving the world and being at home, <laughs> it's and a wide spectrum. <laughs> you know, it it's potentially the widest spectrum, but then also maybe the narrow spectrum, right? Because yeah. it has to do, I think, with what we value. Yes, and, yes. Um, and, and also what's at stake. You know, if, it, with that, if you can't save the world, your home's going to go. Exactly. <laughs> you know? so, so you're actually fighting for, for, for a fundamental um, thing. And I think some of these live. bigger questions, maybe people lost sight of them somehow. Right. So, I mean, I'm the eternal optimist, yes, uh, yes, yes. but I do think that there is always something positive to be found in, in challenge. Too. Yes, yes, yes. No, I mean, there's a little, I mean, I, you know, I spend way too much time flipping through Instagram and Facebook and, and that's something that does not soothe me. <laughs> <laughs> if I could get off my phone, I would be much more soothed. Yeah. Um, but that's a tough one that, that we're all, you know, embroiled in. Um, but there was one silly little, you know, feel-good post where somebody said, oh, you know, you might feel buried and in the dark and overwhelmed and scared, but you're a little seed <laughs> about to bloom into a flower, you know? <laughs> and that was, I, I thought that was kind of a nice way to look at it. <laughs> yeah, that is. That is. <laughs> so I, we're recording uh, at, I don't know if it's the height of the, you know, fear around the coronavirus, but that is where where we are. And and I um, took a group of people on this on an art trip this last right, week. And right. um, as we were moving from one collection to another, it got really quiet. We were on like a little sprinter van, and I noticed that everyone was looking at their phone and right. scrolling through. And I think they were all reading about the virus. And right. I said, "Okay, phones down. Yeah, yeah. Eyes up. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, like phones yeah. down, eyes up. And I asked each person. I said, "Would you be okay?" If if I let us in a meditation. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. everyone said yes, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, looking away from the device and having that sense of community, even for a 15 minute meditation, yeah. it changed the whole energy. No, I know, I know, I know. I mean, it is, it is, uh, I mean, I remember my favorite anecdote is that I was, uh, my husband and I, Jorn, we, 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 we went through a period and we'd still, would like to do more, but 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 we had, we had two, two or three trips to Cuba, um, and this is back in the Obama years, um, and we adore Havana, and uh, this is actually a lot of it was to go see art as well. Yeah. But um, anyways, but we were there. We and and, this, and our, it was our first trip, and this was you know they had no internet there, no right. no Wi-Fi, no you know phone service and anything so we brought our devices um, but couldn't really use them and I also brought uh, James Joyce's Ulysses mm. and I read half of it <laughs> <laughs> I mean it was kind of amazing it was just like the amount of whatever the energy that my brains was suddenly imbued with uh, and certainly being, you know, inspired by the beautiful streets of Havana. But but yeah. I read half of Ulysses kind of easily. Amazing. It was a strange thing. And then I, but I, I eventually I never finished it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I read, I think, I think I read another third or another, you know, chunk. And, um, you know, I, I think I'm going to get it on tape at some point. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not saying I understood it, but it, but it was, it was the ravenous kind of, 
uh, feeling that my brain suddenly had by not, you know, by being disconnected, yeah. you know, officially from whatever the, the webosphere um, was, was pretty profound. I had a similar experience not reading Ulysses, but yeah. taking a group of people to Cuba, and, and I said, like, your, your phones aren't going to work. Yeah, you can yeah. try and go to the lobby of the hotel and buy a 15-minute card, you know. Yeah, but yeah. for the most Let part, and it was great. People were having margaritas at lunchtime yeah, and, yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah, drinks yeah. they were having. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and, you know, not that that's... But it's yeah, but just were... indicative of, like, the relaxation and the openness and the humor, you yeah. know, that um, was facilitated oh, by... I know. We were actually connected because we were disconnected. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you. I mean, on on the other flip side of that is, I mean, I, we know a lot of people who live in in Havana, and you can't. You know, now you, there is yeah. Wi-Fi, and they love it. Mm-hmm. You know, and they need it, and you know, and it's you can't. Yeah, I don't think there's any way to really go back. But yeah. I would argue that there's a kind of need at some point for a sort of moratorium on phone use. At, at certain points of the day, some sort of cultural uh, movement to uh, just just to shut down for two seconds. It's funny. I just, as you were saying that, remembered that someone asked me if I could invent something without any um, connection to the budget. What would it be? And I was talking about these basically like digital detox sanctuaries, right? You know, right, where okay. you you could check yeah, in and. Go. But anyway. Uh, because I don't know that we have the self-control to, uh, <laughs> no, to no. do that. So uh, what kind of rituals do you have on a, like a daily basis? Yeah, well, I play piano every day. Um, I, I get up, you know, we, now that we have a daughter when we're home, we, we, you know, you get up at seven. Um, I, I'm, I'm fortunate in the sense that uh, because I, there's not so much time in the day with a kid, and just all the other things that happen, I'm allowed to kind of get into my bathrobe and to, we all get up and then I I go get my coffee and I just play piano for like an hour while they're, while, you know, Yorn and Viva are, are having breakfast. I, and, and, you know, I, I accompany their breakfast. Amazing. You know, and then, and then I drive her to school. <laughs> so we do have time to, you know, interact. But, but that's yeah. really the only time that I, I, I try to get like at least an hour in, so... So, which isn't, you know, a tremendous amount of time. There's other times that I do, but I get at least an hour in a day uh, of just going through piano stuff. And then, um, and then I also, I am now, you know, living in LA. I've become a little bit of a workout guy, you know. <laughs> I try, I've, I've gotten into this, you know, to Barry's boot camp. Okay. Which uh, you've, probably heard of yeah uh and that's pretty extreme so i try to do that every day I, i've been finding that the fit you know and especially for men and for women too i, I don't know why I, I just said that it should be for both men and women uh but uh maybe i'm thinking like gay men <laughs> it's it's very it culturally um present you know the going to the gym as a gay man in hollywood so i've just sort of fallen for that um <laughs> stereotype really uh and but it but it's but it is you know it is uh it really does make a huge difference you know for me uh mentally um and physically thank god and uh so i work out i also oh god i mean the other thing and this is another i do get caught up in all the politics and the you know i put on the msnbc radio Thing and while I'm driving through the streets and get all wrapped up in that, um, so that's not great. Um, I, 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 I uh, that that has to be curtailed as well. But it's whatever. Now's the time to kind of get involved. So, so anyways, I'm I'm, I'm paying attention. Um, but then the other thing, I mean, Yorn and I, there's a, this kind of beautiful octagonal room that we have in our house. Very small, but we we're, we're renovating it and turning it into a library. Okay. And we're um, we're really excited about that, and and I've been reading a lot, um, and and it is this kind of, and, and I've gone through periods when I don't read a lot, mm-hmm. and, or I hardly read at all, mm-hmm. and now I'm I'm in another, I'm in it more of a reading period, and I think, and that is, I think actually one of the great 
kind of antidote to society is to read. To read is like, um, I think more important than ever. And, re and reading a physical book, mm -hmm. you know. I agree. That, you know, and that's, um, and that is, and, and, and just being able to, um, whatever, put your mind through that exercise. Uh, and uh, so, and I, and I read, a lot. I've, I've been reading, you know, I've gone through periods where I, I tried to go through a period uh, where I read, I, I started out only reading dead people. Mm-hmm. And then I saw that's not great. I should read, you know, living people too. And I tried that for a while. I've gone back to dead people since. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's something. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I won't read somebody's book. Yeah. But uh, but I find there's a strange thing in reading dead authors where you just really you get their their work is somehow free or something. <laughs> you know, there's something maybe because you have the the whole context of. Of, space of, to process. Of, 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 of what they, you know, that it's lasted, that, that, you know, the world they came from, you know, the importance of that, where they lie uh, in, in, the, in the kind of canon. Um, you know, I mean, right now I'm reading like a lot. You know, I was just up in, in Rye, England. I was in Hast near Hastings, but there's a town called Rye, and that's where um, uh, Henry James lived. So mm -hmm. I, just, I bought a Henry James book of short stories, so I'm reading a lot of those. It also can pertain a lot to my travels. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a big thing. Um, so, so think people, and certain authors that I might hear about, like if I'm in, you know, uh, you know, Estonia, I'll be like, who's, in the, who's like the most famous Estonian writer that I need to, you know. I love and that. And kind of get into, or try to read one of those books. So yeah, reading. So how does singing feel for you? Singing feels great these days. I mean, I've been one thing that's been fortunate for me is that I, you know, I I, um, I write operas um, as well as make records, and 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 fortunately, I've, you know, people are interested in hearing them, mm -hmm. and um, and I've worked really hard to uh, ingratiate myself. Um, towards that um, prickly <laughs> bunch, and uh, and you know there's there's going to be a new production of Prima Donna in Europe coming into in, in Sweden coming out in the fall, and then there's also Hadrian, uh, the, my last opera, which is there's a few places that are are, are going to be producing it as well, so I I work on that. But what's nice about that world is that I don't sing as much. I kind of can relax my voice mm. and. And pay attention on the mu to the music and really work with other singers who are interpreting uh, my my compositions and um, and that's actually really good for my voice because mm -hmm. I'm not I'm just not constantly um, battering it uh, on the road which I will be doing <laughs> in the next few months uh, I kind of go through cycles but having this this these periods where I can kind of drop out and be more you know off the stage is uh, really good for my voice, really good for my singing, actually. So I've been learning more about breathing. Yes, and very important. So I knew about breathing from yoga and things yeah. like that, but I recently uh, made a new friend who is a 30-year Air Force, uh, a doctor for the Air Force, and she was talking to me about um, carbon dioxide and, okay. and holding it and how it relates to, oh, really? yeah, okay. brain capacity. Okay. and being able to respond instead of react. Okay. So I wonder about breathing for you. Yes. And how you think about it, if you practice yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I, my breathing technique has, has improved vastly. Uh, and you can hear it on all my recordings. Uh, because when I was very young, um, I mean, I would breathe, I would breathe, I would have to breathe a lot because it was my, I like to write these long, kind of languorous lines <laughs> that require, you know, you to sing a lot. So, so, um, and I would have this thing where I would do a really long line and then it, and then I'd sort of inhale very quickly and, and then, uh, you know, continue. And, and so a lot of my performances, especially not too much of the recordings, but the performances, they're, they're kind of peppered with this kind of hyperventilation at times <laughs> when I'm trying to, you know, get in enough air. Um, and it was really actually when I did the the Judy Garland show, and I was more f much more focused on 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 um, you know strategically 
getting through the song and also really communicating the lyrics and pronouncing them, pronunciate, and my pronunciation of them. Um, and breathing suddenly became a real uh, kind of weapon. Uh, you know, just if you can pick the right uh, spaces, mm -hmm. take the and take the breaths there, and be you know really mindful about it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can be quite seamless, mm -hmm. and you can actually, you know, do the acrobatics needed. I and mean, it's also also working with with opera singers. You know, mm -hmm. they their breathing for them is is kind of everything as well. So, do you think about your breathing when you're not singing? Oh, well, like in life, I I need to no, <laughs> I don't. I probably need to more. Um, I breathe. I mean, it's funny. It's it's hard. It's interesting for me because I, I I'm actually I don't know how to draw that line sometimes because you know whether it's you know, expressing my inner feelings and, you know, bearing my soul or breathing well or sweating, you know. I do so much of that when I'm performing. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but think that it, you know, has a positive effect mm -hmm. and that maybe I'm off the hook a little bit <laughs> for having to do, you know, as opposed to someone who doesn't right. have so physical a kind of, um, you know, job. But that being said, um, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you can't, you know, you're, you're, if you really want to deal with certain issues, you have to um, actually focus on them. And it's just you can't sing your way through it all the time. <laughs> it doesn't always work that way. Does your, how do you write lyrics? Right. Um, well, I, for me, I mean, melodies come to me First? constantly. Okay. Uh, and and I and I even enjoy setting up a kind of situation where I have to write a melody. That doesn't. I have no fear of that whatsoever. Um, lyrics are much harder, um, and I would say, you know, I have to and take a lot more time. Um, I, I you know, for any song I do, or yeah, for any song I do, it's it, they'll usually be about five or six drafts, um, and uh, and I'll, you know, if you look at any of my lyrics, she's just like so crossed out and scribbles, it's hardly, it's really illegible. Um, but the other thing that I like to do sometimes is not write it down mm -hmm. at all and do the lyrics, or maybe like write it down and then lose the paper, because then what I can remember yes. means that it's good. Yeah. If it really stuck with me, then I then it's worth um, saving. So you know, so so that that's that, that's another um, exercise. Um, I also I don't know. There's other funny little things where the, I become quite obsessed with real rhymes as opposed to approximate rhymes. And I find that there's so many approximate rhymes in popular song now that, that it's real. I don't know, it annoys me. Mm. I mean, I have them occasionally as well, mm -hmm. but things, I don't know, it can sound really sloppy to me mm -hmm. when it's like a, with an approximate, when, when, it's, when it's not quite, when it doesn't quite rhyme in a song. I mean, Leonard Cohen is an example of someone who, you know, all his rhymes are, are um, whatever, they're, they're effective, mm -hmm. and this kind of thing of kind of like kind of rhyming is is uh, I, I think is a real problem for for modern songs um, if you're going to rhyme at all. Uh, so so there's that, and then that's interesting yeah. because the idea of writing something down and then sort of allowing yourself to lose it is like the the most um, trusting way of being in the world, right? Which yes. seems, you know, open and like surrendering. And then the precision of an intentional rhyme. Yeah, yeah. So those two things yes, seem yes, yes, contradictory, yes, but, yes, yes. but maybe they're harmoniously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it has to be. I mean, I, as I think most artists, most good artists, um, will would agree to 
unless they're totally fighting that concept, you know, uh, philosophically, you know, unless it's you know not part of their mandate, is that all and I, all art is already created. I mean, you're just basically there to kind of like chisel it out or dust it off or like the and 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 especially with songs, it's there's just a strange moment where you where you realize it's finished and 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 that you were just sort of a vessel <laughs> to get this message here and that there was some communication with some other kind of entity that was uh, facilitated through what it, whatever means and um, you know so it's uh, that 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 to me is also you know part of the part of the um, equation. I'm I'm an old I'm old fashioned in that way. Well, that's such a fascinating and generous way of talking about creativity. <laughs> and I mean, of course, every truth also has its opposite, right? Yeah. So there is this notion of you know postmodernism, right? Like right. that nothing's new. Yeah. But that's not what you're saying. You no. know, you're saying that you have the opportunity to tune into some kind of larger um, creative wellspring, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And in order to do that, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking that you have to be, you know, open to receiving those, yes, those yes, kind of messages, yes, yes. right? Well, I think, I, think it's, I think it's that literally, for me, I think that literally all of those... Um, characters exist I mean all of those I, I, I'm more I'm more hocus pocus about it in the sense that every everything exists already um, I, and and you have to you know you have to just allow it to come in you know I, I mean I mean it, I can I can really relate to that to it very fundamentally with opera because you know for the two operas that I've written there was a definite moment where I knew that those characters, had to come to life, and that I had to breathe, um, you know, life into them through my composi- comp- composing, and um, and and it was it was a life or death thing, you know. It's like they were hounding to you know to be set free, and uh, and I, you know, totally uh, believed that they were that they that they exist and. And um, and I and I find that with all like for me operas is is, is just a, a a wealth of of of, um, of of examples of that you know like you know Madame Butterfly Salome you know Brunhilde they, these 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 are bigger than the composers that created them you know these 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 um, archetypes and they are. You know, and they, it's them kind of busting their way into the world as opposed to us, you know, you know, being the, you know, geniuses who, you know, who, who make it happen. Um, there's a very interesting, I mean, that one of the, one of the, this is another, this is another, um, like little Facebook moment where, where somebody, and I think it was this, it was actually Daniel Mendelssohn, uh, who's, a, who's a very good writer um, and, and historian. He wrote this. He just put this picture up of, and it, and it was, uh, it was a picture of, um, uh, oh, uh, uh, Thomas Mann, who's one of my favorite writers. Yes. And he said, uh, and, and he has a quote that says, you know, writing, and I'm totally paraphrasing right now, but it's like, writers find it really hard to write. It's hard to write, you know, and and it's and it, and it's this idea like, oh, if you're an artist, it must come to you naturally, like it must, but it's really difficult. It's like giving birth. It's like, you know, it's it's, it's a toilsome, you know, it's, it gives you joy too, I guess, or something, but it's, but it's, 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 it's a difficult um, kind of exercise. And um, I don't know, I think it's because you have to, you know, you're, you're just under the, you're, 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 you're dominated by the subject. You so know. do you feel like you have to be good to get the information or do you feel like it's a reward or are those terms too small um i think you have to be educated in Mm -hmm. a way Mm -hmm. um whether it's like you've practiced your instrument or Mm -hmm. you've read a lot of books Mm -hmm. or you've experienced 
crazy mm-hmm. things in your life, like mm-hmm. gone out, like a sentimental education. Uh-huh. You know, it's you know you have to educate yourself on on so many fronts, and um, and that is, uh, and and you you can't be passive about it. You know, um, like someone said to me, and and this is you know. With, with classical music, what I love so much about it, and which I find so important, is that uh, I mean, yes, I mean, the, there's pop music that's really interesting, and I even, you know, yeah, the Beatles are great, and and I love, you know, Joni Mitchell and all of this stuff, and I think it's if you really get into it, you can really, you know, progress and become it, you know, and 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 widen your horizon. That being said, you know, listen to a whole Mahler symphony <laughs> or, or a whole Wagner opera. That's, that's the material that takes you and forces you to like totally get out of your comfort zone and, you know, be catapulted into this, you know, this new realm. And um, so I'm, I'm a big, you know, traditionalist in terms of like the great works of art that, that if you really study them, they're there, you know, you can't be passive with great works of art. You have to, you have to, uh, you're forced to react or to, to, to change, you know? And so much of art right now is so, so much of, of, of the experience of, of, of listening and, and looking at stuff is very passive, I find, right now. Yeah. So what do you love about art? What do I love about art? Uh, well, I, I mean, I was just thinking, you know, that, Another another little Facebook moment. Uh, no, I was I was there, there was a great postcard that I found um, on my piano, and, and it was from the. It wasn't from I think it was from Lakma, and it was a beautiful John Singer Sargent uh, painting uh, of a man with like laurels in his hair, like a young man. I and I and I and it just really struck me incredibly uh hard and and i and i post and i took a picture of it and put it on facebook and then there was this really you know conversation that ensued because he was this, obviously this object of beauty and it was just you know, really intriguing and then then someone else brought up another painter that they liked from the same period um and uh i can't remember his name but uh anyways and then i looked at some of his paintings and then but then with john singer sergeant i just I kept going back to like, no, he's, 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 he's my favorite painter, but, um, how there is this sorcery that mm-hmm. he has, you know, with light and just his subjects and where, and just the angles of things and the brushwork that is truly magical. You know, I, I think when art is, is great, it's truly magical. Uh, and, um, and just, and, and when you compare, you know, the different works, um, and you come into contact with the real thing, it's, uh, it's just breathtaking, you know, to, 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 uh, to just experience that. And, and I, you know, look, I, like I, as I said, I write operas. I don't know. I, I'm never going to be Puccini. I'm never going to be Verdi. I do other things, but I love the, the art form so much. And maybe I'll have a, a, a touch of that, but, but it's through my kind of experience of just being transported by this, this, this form of art that I just want to, you know, I just want to give back, I guess, or be involved in that. So obviously I love talking to people about art. Yeah. And it makes me so, <laughs> like, happy and excited to hear you talk about um, how it makes you feel, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and one of the things that I love about art is that sometimes the feelings that it evokes are unexpressible, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but when there's an opportunity to feel them and express them and share them with someone else so that maybe they have an opportunity to have some sort of kinship with your experience, yeah, yeah. then I think it becomes, I mean, bombastically exciting. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. I mean, I one of my earliest, I think also for me, it, it's interesting. A lot of it relates to my childhood. I think it's so important to bring kids in, in, into the art world or try to get them engaged. And, um, and, and and for me, I just, you know, I grew up in Montreal and, you know, Montreal's a great city, but it doesn't have like an amazing art 
collection, or may, it probably has a better one now, contemporary art. But um, but when I was a kid in the '80s, it was pretty, it was pretty thin, and um, and we, you know, and occasionally we'd go down to Montreal and, uh, sorry, go down to New York and see great things. But there was this one event that was so seminal in my in my childhood, where I guess the Hermitage had. Uh, released some paintings that had never been seen uh, uh, out of the Iron Curtain. There was a bunch of Matisse's and a bunch of uh, Gauguin's. And, and it was a show, you might remember this show, it was kind of going around, though you were a child too probably, but it was kind of going around North America. Mm -hmm. And one of the stops was Quebec City. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and these paintings were going to be in Quebec City. And, and the whole family got into the station wagon and it was in the middle of the winter and it was freezing and we drove three hours, you know, to go see this art show because these were things that were never seen, you know, in, the, in, in these great works of art in, 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 in this part of the world. And, and it's just, I don't know, it was, and I got all the posters and, and it just made such an impression on me to, to, uh, to, to that, that everyone was participating in this, Feast, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so, 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 yeah. Little events like that are really great, you, and I feel like you can get that out in L.A. Some, New York's harder. I mean, I, I have brothers. I have a sister who grew up in New York, and she was always a little more jaded <laughs> but with what you get there. Right. I mean, it's hard to sort of. But yeah, but but they know how to. You know, it's good to go and see things. It's <laughs> good to go kid. and see things. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. As a kid, and and with people that you love. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. Why do you think art matters? <laughs> Well, um, I still, you know, when I was a, a teenager, I, I believed I, I, I was wholly uh, dedicated to being an artist and musician, and I did a lot of painting, too, as well. Um, and I was, you know, I was, I had already set forth on that path from an early age. Anyways, and I had this friend, one of my best friends, and uh, and he was Dutch, and uh, and he was from a more, his like father was a diplomat, and he was more you know into sports and stuff. He was a great guy. He is a great guy. He's still a very good friend of mine, Frederick. Anyways, but he, but but we were very young. We you know we were fourteen, fifteen, and I, we got into this conversation where. He said, "Well, you know, what matters in the world, is you know history and." these certain battles and this, you know, religions and movements and, and, and I, or like economics or whatever, like he was very much like, and I was like, you know, all that matters is the art. That's all that matters. Cause that's all that we have <laughs> from anything. That's the only thing that lasts, you know, really from the time, you know, and, um, and, you know, whether it's, whether it's, um, the music, like like listening to a, a Beethoven symphony, that's the closest you're gonna get <laughs> to that period of time is listening to that music, um, or seeing the paintings or the pyramids, you know, whatever. It's that's it. That's all, they're all that's left. So so I think it's it's really all that we have is art <laughs> in a lot of ways when you when you boil it down. I think that's the perfect place to end. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, and by the way, Fred came around. <laughs> My friend Fred, he, he agreed with me. So like, he knows now like that art matters. 20 years later, he's like, you're right. Art is all that matters. It's really all that matters. <laughs> art is all that matters. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Conversations about art is part of Art. Simon Illa is our producer. Our theme music was composed by Eric McDougall. Jordan Weisberg is our curatorial associate. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and review us on whichever platform you listened, as it helps us further our goal of connecting all to art. We will be back again every other Tuesday with new episodes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>